The wives of the most eminent Persians went to the king's wife, Tetira, and one of them said, Madame, our Greek female is attacking our households. Everybody has been admiring her beauty for some time. Now that we are involved, the reputation of Persian women is at risk. So we should consider how to prevent this foreign women, woman from scoring over us. The queen laughed. She did not believe the rumors. Greeks are boastful, impoverished creatures, she said. That is why they are so easily impressed. They claim that Calerho is beautiful, as they claim that Dionysius is rich. Rest assured, when she arrives, let just one of us appear in her company, and that will put this wretched slave woman in the shade. They all made obeisance to the queen, and voiced due admiration of her judgment. At first they cried out as with one voice, If only you could show yourself, madam. After that, different views were expressed as they put forward the names of the women most admired for their beauty. A vote was taken, as in civic assembly, and the first choice was Rodogune, the daughter of Zopyrus and the wife of Megabizus, and a celebrated beauty. What Calerho was to Ionia, she was to Asia. The women took her and dressed her up, each of them contributing something of her own to her adornment. And the queen, too, gave her bracelets and a necklace. So, when they had enhanced her beauty for this meeting with her rival, she appeared on the scene, ostensibly to receive Calerho. There were suitable grounds for this, in that she was the sister of Pharnaces, the man who had written to the king about Dionysius. All Babylon poured out to see the spectacle, the crowded the people crowded round the city gates. Rodoguni, royally escorted, took up her position in full public view. She stood there luxuriating in her beauty as if challenging comparison. Everyone gazed at her, and as they gazed, they said to each other, We have won. Our Persian will outshine that foreign woman. Let her stand the comparison if she can. Let Greeks learn that they are mere braggarts. At this point, Dionysius arrived. When he was told that Pharnaces' relative was there, he leapt down from his horse and approached her in friendly greeting. She blushed. I want to welcome my sister, she said, and as she spoke, she moved towards the carriage. It was impossible for Calerho to stay hidden any longer. Against his will and groaning to himself at this embarrassment, Dionysius asked Calerho to step forward. Now everyone strained their eyes, indeed their very souls, almost falling over each other in their desire, each to be the first to see and to get as close as possible. Calerho's countenance shone forth in splendor. A dazzling light fell on everyone's eyes, as if bright daylight had suddenly blazed out at dead of night. The Persian people were awestruck and fell to the ground in homage of her, to her. They all acted as if Rodogune were not there. Even Rodogune realized that she had been worsted. Unable to leave, but unwilling to be looked at, she entered the carriage with Calerho, surrendering to her superior. So the carriage moved on with curtains drawn, and the crowd, unable now to see Calerho, kissed the wagon. When the king heard that Dionysius had arrived, he ordered his eunuch Artaxtes to convey the following message to him. Since you are bringing an accusation against a man entrusted with high office, you should not have traveled so slowly. But I am setting aside that charge since you were traveling with a woman. I am at present conducting a religious festival and am busy with these ceremonies. 
I shall hear the case thirty days from now. Dionysius made obeisance and left. So both sides began to prepare for the trial as if it were the greatest of wars. The Persian population was divided. The satraps and their party sided with Mithridates. He was originally from Bactra and had only moved to Caria later. The ordinary people sympathized with Dionysius. They thought he had been treated badly and unlawfully in that an attempt had been made to seduce his wife. And what a wife. That was the most important thing. Not was the Persian woman's side unaffected. Their two sympathies were divided. Those among them who prided themselves on their beauty were jealous of Callerho and hoped the trial would result in some harm to her reputation. But the ordinary women, out of ill feeling to these local beauties, joined in praying that the foreign woman's standing would be enhanced. Each of the two men thought victory was in his grasp. Dionysius' confidence reposed in the letter Mithridates had written to Calerho in Charius's name. He never expected Charius to be living. Mithridates, since he could produce Charius, was convinced that he could not be convicted. But he pretended to be afraid and consulted advocates to enhance the effect of his defense by the element of surprise. For the thirty days ordained, men and women alike in Persia talked of nothing but this trial. If the truth be told, Babylon was nothing but a law court. Everyone found the appointed interval too long, including the king himself. What Olympic Games, what Lunesian knights ever promised such passionate interest? When the appointed day came, the king took his seat. There is a special room in the palace, which is des designated as a law court. An unusually big and beautiful room. In the middle stands the king's throne. On each side are places for the king's friends, those who in rank and ability count among the first in the land. Around the throne stand captains and commanders, and most distinguished of the king's freedmen. One could well say of such an assembly, the gods, sitting at Zeus's table, held debate. Those involved in the case are brought in silence and trepidation. Well, on this occasion, Mithridates was the first to appear. Early in the morning, he was escorted by friends and relatives, and was far from bright and cheerful in appearance, but rather as befitted a man under examination, pathetic to behold. Dionysius followed. He was dressed in Greek style, wearing a Milesian robe, and had the letters in his hand. Once in court, they made their obeisance. Then the king ordered the clerk of the court to read out the letters, that of Pharnaces, and his own reply, so that his fellow judges should know how the matter had come to court. When his letter was read out, there was a great burst of applause. People approved the king's moderation and sense of justice. When silence was restored, Dionysius, as the plaintiff, was due to speak first. All were looking to him when Mithridates said, Sir, I am not trying to put my own case out of turn, but I know the proper disposition of affairs. Everyone necessary to the trial should be present before the speeches begin. Where then is the woman the case is about? You're judged, you judged her necessary because of the letter. You wrote that she should be present, and she is present. So Dionysius should not conceal the main element and cause of the whole affair. Dionysius replied as follows. This is another proof of adulterous intention, trying to expose another man's wife to public view against her husband's wishes. When she is herself is neither plaintiff nor defendant. Now, if she had actually been compromised, 
she would be under examination and would have to appear. In fact, she knew nothing of your designs on her, and I am not calling my wife either as witness or to assist me in the case. So, why should she have to appear? She has no part in the case. Dionysius's argument was legally a good one, but was not likely to carry weight with anyone. Everybody was desperately eager to see Calerho. The king, however, was embarrassed about giving a direct order, so his friends found a plausible justification in the letter he had written. She had been summoned as being essential to the proceedings. Why, they said, it would be ridiculous for her to come all the way from Ionia, and then when she is in Babylon to stay in the background. It was decided then that Calerho should also appear in court, but Dionysius had so far told her nothing. All the way, he had concealed the reason for his journey to Babylon. So now he was afraid to bring her into court without warning, when she did not know what was happening. She would probably be angry at having been misled, and he asked for the case to be postponed to the next day.